You're welcome to, to uh, yeah, start our, our web talk today, Mr. Kamara. Very, very thankful that you're with us. Floor is yours at first. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, dear Mr. Kier from Plettenberg, dear distinguished speakers, dear distinguished guests, good morning and a good morning. I wish to wholeheartedly welcome you all to this seminar entitled Japan and Germany, Guardians of Multilateralism. I'm very pleased to be able to host this seminar in cooperation with the German Council on Foreign Relations. We host this seminar in the framework of the 160th anniversary of the German-Japan friendship. It is a very first event co-hosted by our consulate and the council. We are very happy to have three excellent speakers today from the government as well as academia with deep knowledge on the global politics and international trade. Looking at the current global situation, it is evident that the situation is dramatically changing and the power structure is extremely complex. I think one of the most serious problems in the world today is the challenges against universal values and rule-based international order. Germany and Japan share the basic values such as rule of law, multilateralism, freedom of navigation, free trade, democracy, and human rights. Nevertheless, it is naive to believe that such important values are shared and maintained by every country without any effort. Japan is therefore convinced that we need to reinforce our efforts in order to uphold these important basic values by expanding our cooperation within the region as we are with other regions. With that in mind, Japan is promoting the free and open Indo-Pacific so-called FOIP, which is a vision to expand these basic values with concrete actions in the region and beyond. From this perspective, our government welcomes and highly appreciates the policy guidelines for the Indo-Pacific, which was publicized by the German government last year. There are so many common elements in the vision of the two countries, and I see huge potential of further cooperation between Germany and Japan with a view to contributing to a more stable and pr prosperous world. I would be very delighted if you could bear this in mind and enjoy today's discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, Kawahara. The members and guests of the Consulate General of Japan in Frankfurt of DGP and its form here in Frankfurt. Dear Mrs. Tsuko Kawahara, dear Dr. Friederike Bosse, dear Professor Urata, dear Sebastian Groth and Andrea Schwarzkopf. A warm welcome from Frankfurt and thank you very much for joining today's web talk in these relatively early morning hours in Germany and late afternoon in Japan. Special thanks go to Consul General Satsuko Kawahara and her team from the Consul General of Japan in Frankfurt and our DGAP colleagues in Berlin for helping to prepare this talk. We feel very honored and are very thankful for celebrating 160 years of Japanese and German friendship also through today's discussion. Professor Rata is Professor Emeritus of Waseda University. They was the Professor of International Economics at the Graduate School of Asia Pacific Studies. Professor Rata received his Bachelor in Economics from Kaiyu University, followed by an uh, MA and PhD in, in uh, Economics from Stanford University. He is a former research associate at the Brookings Institution and economist of the World Bank. Warm welcome. Die Kirsten Tedlow is unfortunately not able to join today's talk. But instead, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Federica Bosse. Dr. Federica Bosse is an expert in Asia with a specialized uh, a special focus in Japan since over 30 years. From 2006 until 2018, she was Secretary General of the Bilateral Foundation Japanese German Center in Berlin. She received her PhD at Hamburg University where she studied Japan studies, business and German literature. Warm welcome. Sebastian Gold is the Director of Policy Planning at the Federal Foreign Office, where he, amongst, where he, amongst others, previously held um, positions of Deputy Director of, um, for Policy Planning and Director of the State Secretary's Office. 
He started his career at the Foreign Office 2001 as first, as first secretary at the German Embassy in Nairobi. Sebastian Groth studied political economy and sociology in Cologne and Montpellier. These were, due to the time we have, um, short time we have this morning, just also very short bios of our speakers, which you will find extended in our uh, invitations and, of course, in the internet. The year 2021 is a special year for Japanese and uh, or Japanese and German um, relations. On January 24th, 1861, the Japanese Shogunate and Prussian envoys signed a treaty of friendship, trade, and navigation in Edo. Since then, these so-called unequal treaties have developed into a relationship of equals that has now existed for decades. Japan and Germany share many characteristics and have enjoyed a very strong friendship throughout their respective histories. In this context, the panel will discuss how to strengthen multilateralism in an international environment that is characterized by growing instability, systemic competition, and national rivalries. How can Japan and Germany improve efficiency in international decision-making? What have the benefits of their partnership been so far? And how can cooperation be reinforced to make the most out of it in the future? The web talk will be moderated by Andreas Schwarzkopf, head of opinion section of Frankfurter Rundschau. And our audience will have the chance to send us some questions to the chat function or raise their hands and our speakers will respond to them within the last 45 minutes, minutes of today's talk. Dear all, please note that this talk will be recorded and parts of it will be used, for example, in social media and, for example, on DGP's YouTube channel. If you ask a question later on, we understand that you agree that your name will be mentioned together with such question. Thank you very much. It's great to have you with us. And Professor Water, the floor is yours. Uh, greetings from Frankfurt to Japan. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to begin by uh, pointing out the importance of uh, EU-Japan Economic Partnership Agreement. Uh, which was in an uh, entry now. Uh, first of all, EU is a very important uh, region or group of countries for Japan, not only in terms of economics, but also in other areas, uh, political uh, situation, national security, and so on. But uh, being an economist, I'd like to emphasize the importance of EU-Japan EPA to promote uh, Japan's uh, economy. Japan's economy is not really uh, doing very well, and uh, future prospects of Japanese economies are not so optimistic either, because, uh, mainly because of the declining and aging population. Uh, so in order for Japan to grow, uh, Japan needs to rely on external economies, such as the EU. And the EU, is, like I said, is a very important partner for Japan. In terms of trade, EU is uh, uh, behind uh, China and US uh, as an important uh, partner for Japan. Uh, in terms of foreign direct investment, EU is the number one, uh, the most important partner for Japan. So uh, EU Japan EPA uh, is, according to some estimate, uh, will increase Japan's GDP by 1% at least. And as I know, uh, many companies, Japanese companies, are using, uh, so-called using EU, Japan EPA. And um, because of this, uh, Japanese economy is benefiting uh, a lot from uh, EU, Japan EPA. And in addition, EPA is not just an economic partnership agreement, although it says the economic partnership agreement, it involves many other uh, things, including kind of cultural exchange and so on. And particularly in the case of Japan, uh, EU, uh, this, uh, uh, we have arrangement on political uh, economy uh, aspect as well. So, uh, well, I, I just like to begin by uh, emphasizing the importance of EU Japan EPA as a start. And let me just uh, uh, stop here. Thank you.
No. Thank you very much, and Mr. Water, for your for your introduction. And I would like to um, welcome Frederica, uh, Dr. Frederica Bosse now for her uh, input. This is possible. Yes, thank you very much. Good morning from my side. And thanks also for the invitation for organizing this uh, um, symposium. This year, we are celebrating 160 years of diplomatic relations. And all in all, uh, this relationship can really be called a stable, reliable friendship. And um, there are many parallels between Japan and Germany. After 1945, both supported the international order that was built up, and they are very active members in many multilateral organizations. And both countries profited a lot of this international order. They experienced enormous growth and wealth over the years. Germany and Japan often call themselves partners in value, as also Council Kawahara said. They share values like democracy, market economy, rules-based order, and multilateralism. And that is true. But that does not mean that they always have the same opinion about how to react. It does not mean that they always walk in the same direction. And it does not even mean that they always understand each other's way. Just think about nuclear energy, how differently it is taken up. Actually, I experienced very often frustration and irritation in German-Japanese discussions, which might sometimes stand in the way of closer cooperation. The main reason seems to me that it is important to remember that it is interests that make countries act rather than values. And in terms of interest, Japan and Germany differ noticeably. When in 2018, Minister Maas presented the concept for the Alliance of Multilateralism during his visit to Tokyo, and he invited Japan to pool our strength and become together something like a rule shaper. The reaction of the Japanese side maybe was a little bit less enthusiastic than he might have uh, expected. Japan is not part of NATO or a similar security alliance. It depends on the United States for its military security. The relationship with the United States is most crucial for Japan and cannot be endangered, even by something like a multilateral alliance with European countries. And so that's no surprise that Prime Minister Suga will soon be the first foreign leader to visit President Biden. So multilateralism in general, yes. Alliances with like-minded states, yes. But risking to alienate the United States, no. I do think that the coming white book on multilateralism of the Germany and the new uh, administration, of course, will bring open up some more um, chances to the new dialogue. Exactly the opposite effect actually lead, led to the finalization of the economic partnership agreement between the EU and Japan in 2020, uh, 2019. Both sides had great interest to demonstrate that regional agreements between two large economic blocks were still possible and sensible. After President Trump had withdrawn from TPP and went by for little approach in his trade policy. So in the case of the EPA, the interest of the European and the Japanese side went into the same direction, and that brought energy into the final negotiations. Same interests helped to bring things forward. Of course, evaluation of certain developments and positions can change over time. China seems to be a good example. I remember many discussions with German and Japanese politicians, academics, and business people where the Japanese members warned about China's military assertiveness and called for caution vis-a-vis -vis China. They called the German partners naive when they all in all placed emphasis on the econ economic opportunities rather than the risks of China's rise. And it's not to forget, as uh, Mr. Urata said, China is Japan's biggest traded partner. So Japan can also not afford to ignore economic aspects. But China is simply much closer to Japan than to Germany, and the military threat therefore much more real. Meanwhile, the EU calls China a systemic rival, and it even imposed sanctions on China for the first time just this week. And it closed an investment agreement to ensure market access. Actually, I think it might be worthwhile to talk with Japan about how to balance policy values, policy concerns, and economic interests vis-a-vis -vis China. China and its impact on the international order is a key challenge for Japan and Germany. 
as well as climate-friendly development, resilience against pandemics and under other natural crises. The key for an effective German-Japanese cooperation seems to me to align interests, priorities and objectives and then form define concrete initiatives, including other allies and develop appropriate formats for these initiatives. Germany and Japan will definitely not solve all global challenges, but I'm sure they can create some valuable input if they really join resources. And just as an idea, what we could start with, maybe we could do some intensive scenario building with a lot of different experts from Germany and Japan and then go on from there. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Dr. Bosse. Um, last but not least, uh, Mr. Wood. Floor is yours. Yeah, um, good morning, everybody. Um, Your Excellency, um, 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 Consul General um, um, from Japan, um, um, Mr. von Plettenberg, and all the team members and colleagues also from DJAP. Um, First of all, I would like to thank the organizers also for this event. Um, from the foreign office side, we always appreciate it very much when um, the heavy topics of foreign policy are also discussed intensely, um, uh, not only in, in, in Berlin, but uh, all over the place um, and in such important cities like Frankfurt, especially, um, 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 we value this very much. And in this regard, we really would like to, to thank you for this initiative. Um, as was said before, I think um, this year is special in the Japanese-German um, relationship. Um, we celebrate the 160th um, birthday, but it is also special because a lot of the um, geopolitical, geoeconomic environment is evolving in such a way that um, this partnership is getting even more and more important. Um, I think one could even say that Japan and, uh, and Germany in their respective uh, geographical areas are the most important partners for each other. For us, um, Japan is the key partner um, in East Asia and in the wider Indo-Pacific region. And I think um, at least that's, that's what we get as an echo from Japan. We are one of the most important partners um, within Europe and within the European Union. We have more than 50 formats of bilateral constant exchange between the governments. We have a lot of cooperation in research and civil society. The economy was mentioned. Um, but what is most important, I think we are um, values-based partners, democracies, free economies, interdependent markets, very closely linked um, in a lot of fields of, of economic, cultural and social activity. Um, there is no international format where Japan and Germany do not cooperate in a very, very um, friendly and cooperative uh, manner. I would just like to mention the G7, the G20, United Nations, uh, where we push together the reform um, idea for the Security Council for quite a number of years now. But this cooperation of the United Nations goes far beyond this reform project. Um, we are partners um, in the OECD, uh, but also in the IMF, in the World Bank. We are doing a lot of development projects together. Our development banks, for example, cooperate closely in Africa or Latin America and Southeast Asia. So there is a really a very solid uh, ground and fertile ground um, in this cooperation. Um, I would like now to mention um, two fields um, where I think um, we could um, join forces um, even more intensely. One was mentioned, um, that's the so-called um, Alliance for Multilateralism. It is an initiative that was um, uh, developed by Minister Maas um, together with uh, Minister Le Drian um, two, two and a half years ago um, in a moment where um, the international order and the multilateral system were very much under pressure um, still is under pressure, but the situation, especially uh, in the US, uh, I think changed significantly. Um, and um, there was um, the realization that um, um, the multilateral system and the international order needs more engagement beyond um, the big players, um, even if Germany and France are um, relatively big players, we are, of course, not like 
the US, the shapers of the post, uh, uh, post uh, Second World War, but also post Cold War uh, world order. But we wanted to do something in order to fill the void that was left by the, by the US, but also to do something against the pressure on the system that was exerted um, by other actors in the international arena. So um, this alliance was founded and Japan was active from the very beginning um, and uh, convened in, uh, in New York in 2019. Um, and um, we gathered more than 60 foreign ministers and very concrete projects in six uh, fields um, like cyber, like humanitarian law, um, like gender um, were um, agreed on and um, this alliance is, uh, is, still is still working um, and we still feel that the need um, for this alliance is, um, is still um, there, even if um, um, the, the change in the American administration gave a new push also to the multilateral rules-based um, cooperation. Um, but um, I think um, three um, arguments uh, are still very valid and speak for this um, alliance approach. First of all, what we had in mind and have in mind is um, an issue-based uh, network um, of partners that are very pragmatic and that want to um, look for <clears throat> concrete solutions um, in the field of international politics. And um, we don't want a heavy um, institutional backload and structure but an issue-based cooperation. That's why normally the alliance meets at the margins of international meetings that's go, that's, that go on anyway. Last meeting, for example, was in Geneva during the Human Rights Council. The second argument for the alliance is the geographic scope. Um, I think that um, um, it is very important um, in, in, in upholding the multilateral system that we look uh, for new partners um, beyond the usual sub suspects. And that's why um, it is so important that in the alliance we have partners like Mexico, like Ghana, like South Africa, like Singapore, um, that we, we have a very solid also bilateral relationship, but not so far um, in the fields of multilateral cooperation. And this is especially true for partners in, in Africa and Latin America. Um, and the third argument um, that speaks for the alliance, I think, is the um, idea to develop a real multi-stakeholder approach. That means that multilateral cooperation goes more and more beyond the traditional inter-state cooperation, but that we need other stakeholders as well, like um, civil society, the economy, science, um, that, um, that are um, gathering around very concrete subjects and, and bringing solutions to the table. There are so many things like, um, for example, artificial intelligence or data management that you can't do without um, actors uh, beyond um, governments um, that we think the one of the futures of multilateralism lies in this multi-stakeholder approach. A second um, point of very concrete um, cooperation between um, Japan and, and Germany, Japan and the European Union um, is the big field of connectivity. Um, in 2019, the European Union uh, convened um, a big conference in Brussels um, about um, connectivity and um, Prime Minister Abe at this time was the guest a speaker and um, a, a strong partnership was agreed between Japan and the European Union. Now, due to COVID, um, there was so far not a real um, follow-up summit, but the German government is, is very, very interested in reaching out to Japan in order to look for concrete fields of cooperation um, in, um, in um, connectivity, bearing in mind that this is a very important um, subject and leitmotiv of Japanese uh, foreign policy for an economic policy as well. So we see a lot of um, uh, potential in Southeast Asia, but also in Central Asia or in Africa um, for this, um, for this um, um, endeavor. Um, now, if you allow, I would like to make a final remark on the white paper on multilateralism that we are working on, on the foreign, um, in the foreign office. Um, this white paper will be the first um, government-wide um, document um, that will present the core interests, the priorities 
um, but also the benefits that, that Germany gets, um, invests and gets um, from the multilateral system. We came to this um, conclusion to prepare the white paper um, and it is in agreement between the foreign minister and the chancellor. Also, after um, we felt more and more the need to explain to the German public the benefits of multilateralism against uh, um, a pressure of um, um, sovereignist and partly um, uh, isolationist uh, rhetoric that is coming up, not so much probably in Germany, because there's still a lot of support for multilateralism, but as a general mood in, in Western societies. And the second uh, argument was that um, very concretely in a poll made by the Körber Stiftung, two thirds of the people um, uh, answered that they don't know what multilateralism really means. So um, we all know that it's a very complicated word with uh, seven syllables and we uh, have a hard time to, um, to pronounce it. Um, but what it really means beyond the fact that uh, several um, countries cooperate um, is, is not very well known into the broader public. So one of the missions of this white paper is also to, to explain to a broader public what it really means. So what we are doing now is um, prepare um, a document with four main pillars. Um, one on the international law side and the, um, and the rules that are the basis for the cooperation. And then have, we have three um, policy chapters, one on peace and security, multilateral, multilateralism for peace and security, multilateralism um, for the people. Um, that means um, everything um, with regard um, to, um, uh, to trade, to economic development. Um, and um, uh, multilateralism for sustainability. So that's all um, with regard to climate, to energy policy, water policy, biodiversity. We are planning to present this white paper to the broader public end of April, um, beginning of May. We are now in the process of finalizing it together with our fellow ministries in the German government and the chancellery. Yeah, and we are very much looking forward also to sharing this with friends and partners and to discuss it with friends and partners and also, as Ms. Bosse said, to see um, which concrete fields of action we can draw from this document to, um, yeah, to further um, support and develop um, the multilateral um, system. So um, let me conclude um, probably by, by saying that I fully share also the comments made by the Consul General in the very beginning we are um, um, living in a very special moment um, where um, especially um, actors like, like China put a lot of pressure on, on the um, international system and that we have to find a common strategy to navigate in this very complex uh, geopolitical and, and, and geoeconomic environment. As, you, as was said earlier, both Japan and Germany share this challenge of being economically linked very, very deeply to China, but on the same time being um, politically um, in, um, in a very different um, um, mindset. Uh, and in this regard, um, I can also only underline um, uh, what was said earlier, that we are really living in a time um, of, of, of competition, of systemic uh, rivalry, and that makes it all, all the more important that um, the, these values-based partnerships like the Japanese, um, uh, European and Japanese-German partnerships are playing um, a much more important role than ever before. Thank you very much. Yeah, vielen Dank. Um, and, uh, uh, thank you very much. Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, and I would like to start uh, with my first question to Mr. Orata. Um, the you and China uh, agreed on a comprehensive agreement on investment. How did Japan react on that? Was Japan irritated like the US or um, did Japan ignore it? Well, uh, th thank you very much for the uh, very important and maybe difficult question. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, uh, responses are divided, so to speak. Uh, some people think, you know, it is very kind of constructive uh, approach by the EU, say, to have an agreement uh, and then uh, make sure that uh, China 
comply with the uh, commitment. And that's how uh, we can expect China to maybe, quote unquote, correct some uh, uh, you know, unfair trade practices, so to speak. Uh, so that, that's one kind of response. So in other words, it was, uh, they, they support the EU's uh, approach to China. Uh, on the other hand, like the US, I guess, uh, uh, this uh, kind of agreement uh, from the EU side uh, can be seen as a, a gesture to support uh, uh, China uh, overall, kind of, including uh, in human rights issues and so on. So in other words, in order to uh, make, uh, correct China's such an unethical behavior, uh, having a, a, a bilateral you know, investment treaty uh, may not be so uh, productive, so to speak. So there are two uh, different, I think, responses from two different kind of groups, I think. But I, I'm on the former side. I think it is uh, good to have uh, agreement, uh, some kind of arrangement with China. And then through this uh, arrangement or through this uh, channel, uh, uh, communication has to be uh, you know, uh, carried out uh, extensively, intensively, and to uh, make sure that uh, they know what we want them to do. So I, I'm on a kind of, I, I'm a, uh, with kind of EU, in other words, I support the EU's uh, approach toward China in this regard. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my next question goes to Mr. Kord. Um, it refers also to the CAI, the treatment with, between uh, China and you. Um, the treatment raised a lot of discussions um, and especially from Washington was um, hearing, we heard that they were irritated. Um, didn't you expect some kind of this or why um, was it so close or around the election of Mr. Biden? Well, um, you know, the um, negotiations um, on this agreement started six years ago. So it is not that um, um, there was um, a, a certain uh, sense of rush or urgency um, to finalize it, but it was the end point of a very difficult and very long way that both the European Union and, and China uh, went along. Um, my second point is that um, um, we think it is a relatively balanced agreement uh, with um, three main elements. One, one is market access, which will be strengthened for European companies. Investment um, will be facilitated. Um, and thirdly, and this is very important, um, we are um, starting a discussion with the Chinese um, counterparts on standards sustainability and labor standards. Um, this is part of the agreement. Um, so uh, we think that um, this agreement uh, strengthens the strategic position of the European Union vis-a-vis uh, -vis China and has to be seen in the bigger framework of the strategic approach of the European Union towards China. Um, my third point is that um, we don't know yet if this agreement really will enter into force very soon. Um, due to the developments uh, the last uh, two days, um, we might face um, a very um, controversial discussion, especially in the European Parliament, because uh, some of the um, sanctions um, um, that were um, formulated and put in place by China um, are targeted at uh, European parliamentarians, as you know, and they have a very important um, word to say on this agreement. Um, so my feeling is that um, we um, negotiated an agreement, but we don't really have it in place yet, and it will take another time uh, to really um, yeah, um, ratify it and implement it and, 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 and realize its potential. 
my next question goes to Ms. Bosse. Uh, I would like to know how you look at that treaty and the relationship to Japan and Germany or EU. And, uh, but could you emphasize on the side what should be done to uh, de develop uh, the relationship between the EU and uh, Europe or Germany, uh, EU and Japan, sorry. And um, which would, which should be the next steps to uh, reinforce the relationship between Japan and the EU? In, in what area do you mean? Yeah, economically speaking. Economically speaking. Um, so the, uh, the, the CAI, I am share the um, ambivalent um, judgment of Mr. Groth, actually. Um, I also think it's highly skeptic. I'm skeptical whether it will ever or soon um, get into place. Um, interesting is uh, also the, um, the two sides response from the Japanese side that Mr. Urata told us. Some that said, yes, we, we support the approach of the EU. And some said, well, maybe um, this um, uh, agreement rather supports China's way. Um, my guess also is that um, maybe it was not the bad worst timing um, to finish it um, at the end of the year, because it was clear there was a change in the US administration. And China maybe was a little bit more um, willing to um, consent to uh, to make concessions into uh, within this um, agreement um, because it wanted it finished before the new um, administration was in place. Um, but as we say, it, it's rather skeptical. It's it's doubtful whether it will ever be uh, come into place. And I would like to notice that there was another um, big agreement um, at the end of last year that was finished, and that is the RCEP with the ASEAN, um, China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand joined uh, on a la let's, uh, lower integration scale than um, the European, like the EPA, for example, between J Germany or Europe and um, Japan. But it is one of the first ones um, where Japan and China are in one agreement together. And um, I think many of those um, agreements in the region, in the East Asian, especially between the ASEAN, they started on a low key and then slowly they um, intensified the integration and the cooperation. So it might be also the case here with this RCEP. And uh, I would actually like to hear from Mr. Urata how he sees whether this would, um, this RCEP is a step um, to get China do what we want them to do, as he put it, I think. Um, so that would be actually um, interesting for me to hear from his, um, uh, yeah, from his side. Thank you. Uh, I just pass the uh, question to Mr. Urata. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to talk about RCEP uh, in my initial kind of remarks, but I kind of, uh, I thought I was given a very few minutes, so I didn't really do it, but let me do it now. <laughs> and I, I think uh, uh, RCEP uh, to Japan is very important uh, for various reasons. One is uh, like, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Bo said, Japan doesn't have a uh, free trade agreement or free trade kind of arrangement with China and South Korea either. So these are two countries, uh, two important trading partners for Japan. China is number one, Korea is number five. And uh, so it is a very, a very beneficial for Japan to have a kind of free market access to uh, China and to South Korea too. And uh, so from economic point of view, uh, it's very, it will be very important. And according to a government estimate, uh, which just came out uh, one day or two days ago, uh, according to this estimate using an economic model, uh, RCEP would increase Japan's GDP by 2.7% percentage point, which is quite huge because Japan is growing at the rate of like um, you know, 1% or less. And of course, because of COVID, uh, 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 
growth rate is negative, quite substantial negative. So in other words, uh, from the economic point of view, uh, from the point of view of Japanese economic, economic growth, uh, RCEP uh, would be a very beneficial arrangement for us. And on top of that, I think uh, what is important is the rules uh, which have been implemented, which would be implemented through RCEP. Uh, like, uh, as uh, Dr. Wolf said, this is not as high level, so to speak, as the uh, EU, Japan, EPA, or CPTPP, that's a Comprehensive Progressive uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP-11. Uh, but nonetheless, it has uh, rules on e-commerce, for example. Uh, it has rules on investment. It has rules on intellectual property rights and so on. So uh, these rules, we hope, or many members, maybe except China possibly, we hope that the China will comply with these uh, commitment so that uh, uh, we'll have uh, rules-based, uh, fair, open, free trade and investment environment in East Asia. And uh, hopefully uh, in the future, uh, through the, uh, you know, they have review uh, committee set up and so on, uh, through this uh, evaluation or reviewing of the arrangement, uh, we'd like to see a upgrading of the uh, uh, rules. Uh, and again, as uh, Dr. Boss has correctly pointed out, uh, regional kind of arrangement, regional frameworks in Asia uh, takes this uh, kind of approach, which is a gradual kind of improvement. And that's what a uh, uh, country like Japan hopes to see in this RCEP. Uh, let me just add one, one more thing. Uh, CPTPP, uh, which came about in 2018, uh, was mostly, uh, well, maybe this is a biased view from a Japanese uh, 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 researcher. Japan played a very important role in concluding CPTPP. Uh, and as was uh, mentioned earlier, uh, Mr. Trump, the President Trump, withdrew the United States from uh, original TPP in 2017. And 11 countries uh, left, uh, you know, because the US left the uh, uh, TPP, uh, 11 countries were left to do, you know, what to, they were at loss kind of what to do. And Japan led the group and to start negotiations and then concluded this agreement. And then now it's in action. So. Japan is contributing to, in my view, uh, uh, establishing rules-based uh, trading system in Asia Pacific and East Asia. And also, let me just add one more arrangement called FOIP, free and open in the Pacific. Although it's just an initiative stage, uh, Japan is trying very hard to uh, promote this uh, initiative uh, for various reasons. One, Belt and Road Initiative by China. Uh, this could be a balance, a counterbalance. I mean, this uh, FYP, Free and Open in the Pacific, can be a counterbalance to China's Belt and Road Initiative. As you know, China's BRI is causing, causing some problems. Uh, and so uh, in order to kind of rectify these problems, uh, I hope FYP can contribute to that. And finally, Sorry, that I, I've been too long. Uh, I just want to add one more thing. India was supposed to be in RCEP, but India dropped out, dropped out from RCEP negotiation uh, toward the end of negotiation. So, but India is a very important country for various reasons, democratic country and so on. So FYP, free and open in the Pacific, of course, includes India and India, Japan, Australia, U.S. are now core members of this FYP initiative. Sorry that uh, I, I spoke too long. So uh, uh, let me let me end this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, before I ask Mr. Crowd uh, again, 
Uh, I would like to remind our audience to type down a couple of questions if you have questions. Uh, Mr. Gord, uh, in Germany, we had a discussion about the rivalries between China and the US and uh, the, well, the anxiety growth that you is coming in between it and um, uh, is struggling to find their position in between it. Uh, could you uh, just summarize uh, the discussion or could you just say where Germany is heading to? Mr. Kurt? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, no, I think you're right. Um, uh, Chinese um, American uh, competition is the main uh, paradigm of, of international relations and geopolitical environment that, that we're in. Um, now but probably for the next five to 10 15 20 years um, we understand um, our own um, position not in a sense of equidistance uh, between these two um, powers uh, not at all um, the um, economic um, political historical cultural links between um, germany the us between the european union and the us are so profound and 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 deep uh, that um, I think there is no doubt in this in this transatlantic alliance. Um, for Minister Maas, um, um, aligning um, policies on China um, between um, um, the U.S. And, and Germany, between the U.S. and the European Union, uh, is one of the main priorities um, and uh, the signals that we get um, from the US side is that there is also a very, very big interest to cooperate and to coordinate with allies uh, now. And we've seen this with um, the trip from Foreign Minister Blinken and Minister for Defense um, Austin uh, to Asia, including Japan where um, I think this outreach um, to important allies and friends in the region, uh, in this case Asia, um, was um, already very visible. Um, and the same is going on with, with Europe. Blinken just um, attended um, the NATO foreign affairs meeting yesterday. Um, so um, um, the, the, um, the important point here is that um, it is a necessity for Europe um, to define its own um, yeah, um, geopolitical and, and geoeconomic, um, as we say, sovereignty or identity, its capacity to act, to, to be present at all, and, and to be not, uh, not just an object uh, of global politics, but a subject. And that means that there might be also some fields of discussion with our American friends, if you look to trade policy, if you look to tech policy, for example. Um, but that, that, that does not put into question the deep-rooted alliance that we have with the Americans. Whereas um, with the Chinese side, I see a number of very difficult um, points um, that we have to raise um, and as we did on Monday in the Foreign Affairs Council in Brussels um, with um, sanctioning um, some individuals um, for human rights violations in Xinjiang. So the message is very clear that um, um, Europe is self-confident. Uh, Europe wants to play a role on the global stage, but there is no um, question about any equidistance between the two um, world powers or great powers but always a very solid alliance between Europe and the US. Thank you. Uh, my next question goes to Ms. Bosse. Um, I, I will read a question from Mark Fisher uh, because it fits uh, perfectly into our discussion right now. So Mr. Fisher, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, Mr. Fisher wants to know, international environment is characterized by growing instabil instability, systemic competition, and national rivalries. What can Japan and Germany really do to strengthen rules-based environment and challenge actors like China who, came, who, who game the system? 
um, instability will probably um, uh, be there for for quite a while, if if not forever. Um, what reminds me, um, Mr. Groth said the approach within this multilateral uh, um, white book is issue-based cooperation. And actually, I like this um, expression, and it reminds me of a trend in business. It's called agile, agile going on. Actually, it's similar. You don't always look for the whole thing, the, the very end uh, objective, but you go one step and you choose to, to solve this. And then you go on, look what is changing now and how you go to the next step. Um, and I think this might probably be the thing to do um, for the time to come. And especially with, um, then you can also try out in which areas, in which issues, and in what kind of formats you can cooperate very good with someone like Europe and uh, Germany and Japan, for instance, and then build on that experience to um, plan or uh, start another initiative, the next one. I don't know whether it will be possible um, to find the grand vision for a new multilateral uh, order, and who will enforce it anyway? Um, even if whoever starts to uh, draw this kind of vision, who, who could in, enforce it? So maybe it is really better, the better way, the more effective way um, to start from little points. Also like the RCEP and um, the, the T, name, TPP 11, <coughs> these kind of um, Bausteine, um, steps, and you put them together and in the, in the end, you get something like a building um, and you always have to um, adjust again and look whether you are still in the right direction uh, overall. But for me, this um, so seems to be the most promising approach um, for now. Okay, um, next question uh, goes to Mr. Orata. I have to read it just a second. Um, it comes from Mr. Kraft, Heinrich Kraft. Thanks to, for your question. Um, Mr. Urata, uh, Mr. Kraft wants to know, oh, I'm sorry, Kraft, uh, do you expect that the U.S. returns to the TPP under Biden? What would be necessary to facilitate this? Could Japan help? The Biden administration seems to be reluctant to enter any free trade agreement. Mr. Urata? Yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm afraid that uh, Mr. Biden or the U.S. will not come back to uh, TPP or CPTPP uh, so soon. Uh, we know uh, their first priority is a domestic economy and providing jobs. So if uh, Bi Mr. Biden is successfully uh, recovering the U.S. economy, that's a necessary condition for the U.S. to come back to the uh, CPTPP. Uh, and uh, midterm election next year is a key. Of course, that is a key. Uh, uh, I mean, one important issue is whether, again, the uh, U.S. can recover from this COVID-19 pandemic situation and provide jobs. And if that happens, uh, you know, Mr. Biden will win the election, uh, midterm election. And also then uh, I think he has, uh, 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 well, he, he can really, uh, deal with external trade issues such as CPTPP. Uh, so that's that's my kind of uh, 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 you know take on possible uh, uh, development regarding uh, uh, CPTPP, TPP, uh, and the United States. Uh, can I can I just make one comment on the uh, previous question? Very important question from. Uh, Dr. Fisher, uh, sure. you know, China is a, 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 a very, China and the U.S. rivalry is uh, becoming very active. I don't think will, this will go away soon. So country like Germany and Japan, uh, we have to admit that we are middle powers uh, as opposed to, you know, great powers of China and the U.S. So, but Germany and Japan can uh, be the leader of uh, middle power country groups, say Germany in uh, Europe, 
Japan, Asia Pacific, or Indo Pacific. And so we can lead the discussion. We can really lead the discussion as to what the multilateralism uh, uh, should look like or what to do with WTO reform. Uh, and, uh, and then we can influence. So we can, uh, you know, uh, create or generate the momentum toward multilateralism, I think. So these are the roles of the Germany and Japan to lead the discussion among the like-minded countries in Europe for, the, for Germany, Asia Pacific or Indo-Pacific in Japan. And if uh, Germany and Japan can cooperate and coordinate in this discussion, I think we can have, uh, we, we may be able to say, uh, resuscitate or recover multilateralism. That, that's my hope. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, we talked a lot about uh, rivalries um, uh, and uh, economy. Uh, I would like to change the subject into uh, the discussion about uh, COVID crisis because um, it's a common sense that COVID crisis will be solved only if uh, vaccination is uh, worldwide done. Um, but right now there's, or it seems not that there uh, is a plan. And I would like to know from Mr. Court, what should be done and uh, how can it be organized, uh, including China, for example. China is starting already uh, sending uh, Chinese vaccination, not all over the place, but to a lot of countries. So will be a uh, pandemic uh, or the fight against the uh, COVID crisis be organized internationally or will it be just uh, bilateral and everybody is trying to um, have an advantage, Mr. Court? Yeah, thank you very much for this um, very important question. Um, Indeed, what we see is a, is a very fierce uh, competition uh, in the context of the pandemic. Um, in the first phase, we saw the so-called mask diplomacy by actors like China and, and Russia and others. Now in this second phase, we see um, vaccine diplomacy, uh, Sinovac and Sputnik and others um, um, are distributed um, all over the place. Germany took very early uh, in this crisis the decision that only a multilateral international answer is um, appropriate. Um, and um, it was also with our support that the European Commission um, in April or May last year um, um, initiated um, a project called um, Act A, Act A um, to gather international donors um, and to create um, a financial facility called COVAX, um, which is part of the WHO structure. So donors, international donors can give money to COVAX and COVAX buys vaccines from the producers and it distributes them to um, more than 92 countries, lower and middle income countries in the world. Um, Germany is, um, I think the biggest donor with 1.2 billion um, euros um, into COVAX and a very strong political supporter. And we are very happy that um, the first deliveries, um, for example, um, to Western Africa, but also to Latin America arrived in the last two to three uh, weeks. Um, when we look a little bit deeper into the issue, um, I think, um, and this is the privilege of policy planning, we sometimes can think um, more in, in the broader picture. We have to ask ourselves, will it be enough? Because all the figures and statistics that we get is, are saying that it takes up to the year 2023 until um, a critical mass of people in Africa, for example, will be vaccinated. But that means that there is a pool out there of uh, potentially infected people that then can um, develop um, mutations that could be brought back 
um, to Europe sooner or later or to Japan or other places in the world. Um, so um, the question is in the midterm, I think, how to, how to construct a decentralized system of vaccine and therapeutics production in the world. Um, and this is the thing that, that we are looking into um, uh, as, 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 as policy planning in the, in the German MFA. It is a very complicated issue because vaccine production is very complicated. We see it even in Europe and in a very sophisticated economy like Germany that um, it takes time, it takes knowledge, it takes a lot of input products, more than 100 um, very complicated input products that are not available freely on the market because everybody needs them now. But um, if we are aware that it takes up to 2023 in the current system to vaccinate the world or at least a critical mass, 60, 70%, we should think about ways um, yeah, how to increase um, the, um, uh, the speed uh, of the effort. And, and I think this, this idea of decentralizing of production is, is, is very important also, once again, to make us more agile. It means that we have, a, uh, that we have facilities, um, for example, in Africa or Latin America, that can react directly to, to mutations and, and stop them there where they spread. So it is in, in the interest also of the global community to invest in these sort of decentralized um, production facilities. Um, I'm pretty sure that we will have this discussion in the next three to six months um, and that we should prepare for it. And um, at least my position is that Germany should play a very active role in this discussion. Thank you. Ms. Bosse, um, what, what do you think should uh, Germany and the EU and Japan do to reinforce that development to uh, uh, vaccination all over the place? Well, regarding um, the COVID pandemic, um, I think it's, in one point it is the symbol of globalization, no? because it would never have been spread around the world without mobility, global mobility and our um, interdependence. And as you said, uh, it will be over, only overcome if vaccination is uh, rolled out globally, basically. At the same time, um, I see a lot of uh, nationalism in the approaches to deal with it. Closing borders, um, no? uh, getting, trying to, to keep the production domestically, which personally I can understand. As you know, Germany is quite hard hit um, and still struggling for uh, getting enough vaccination. So I do understand that on a personal level, but on a political level, it is not the way to success um, in the end. Um, so one thing I think is uh, resilience um, and strengthening resilience towards future pandemics might be a big issue that we could talk about with um, Asian partners, especially with Japan, who has a lot of experience. And if I look how um, the Asian countries dealt with um, and control the pandemic, most of them do much better than we do in Europe. So it might be worthwhile to look how they do it, um, why, they, why they succeeded so much better. And it's not only um, China with these extreme centralized techno um, control mechanisms, but it's also a lot of democratic states like Taiwan, um, Korea, Japan, of course, um, Australia, New Zealand, they all did that better. Why, how come? And what we can we learn maybe from that? And, but even Japan, closed its borders very tightly, still does. Um, and we all heard that even for the Olympics, um, no foreign foreigners will be um, allowed to come in. But Japan has to open its borders for the import of vaccinations because it does not have any own, um, nothing um, developed or produced. So we do need each other um, to strengthen resilience um, against pandemics. And actually that's also a point for Mr. Groth because that's where you can look uh, in the long run. No? Uh, to deal with uh, the current pandemic is one issue in the short term, but in the, in the long term, we need to prepare um, for these kind of um, pandemics that will come again and again, probably. Thank you.
Mr. Owata, I would like to know uh, what Japan will do or should do to reinforce the process of vaccination. Well, uh, as been pointed out, uh, Japan at the moment is is not producing vaccine yet. Uh, we will be, I understand. And of course, uh, doing, uh, like, let's say, uh, research and development in this area is very important. Uh, as I understand it, Japan was not so active in conducting research and development in uh, this kind of vaccine production. And that uh, put us in a very difficult situation. Uh, so, uh, and I guess what we need is a international cooperation, collaboration and research and development in developing vaccines. And also what we learned the importance of transparency, of course that goes back to the origin of the uh, you know, uh, pandemic in China. Uh, if uh, China had a transparent government, uh, we wouldn't have been in a such difficult situation, if I understand correctly. So uh, again, uh, rules are important and also compliance with rules and then uh, making a transparent uh, uh, policy environment. And that will reduce uh, the uh, possible future pandemic. And even if that happens, maybe it's easier uh, for the uh, countries or the government to deal with the pandemic. Uh, that is to say, if we had a more transparent government, uh, we, we'd have a much easier time to uh, deal with this issue. Having said this, uh, I'd like to see a, a development, uh, I'm sure it is happening, rapid development in digital economy. Uh, we are forced uh, because, uh, you know, immobility, uh, physical immobility forced us to uh, rely on digital. And like in universities, we do give all the lectures in uh, uh, digital form. Uh, and so uh, being remote, uh, being away from maybe center does not really affect that much. You can be anywhere almost uh, to put, like, you know, this kind of uh, uh, <laughs> a webinar. Uh, we didn't have this uh, a year ago. So uh, we, we should use this kind of opportunity to develop uh, a system uh, which can be very effective, very efficient, like this webinar. And then we can uh, come out of this uh, crisis with some positive uh, impact. Uh, so that's what I'd like to see happen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the last question changes the subject again, and the question goes to Mr. Orata. Um, Mr. Kraft again, I believe. Yes. Mr. Kraft wants to know, Russia is playing a negative and divisive role in Europe. How is Russia seen from Tokyo, given its closer relations to China and the continuing conflict about the Northern Territories? Mr. Mm. Murata? Well, well, Japan has, of course, territorial problem. I mean, from the maybe Russian side, uh, we don't have that, but uh, from our side, uh, we like to the uh, return of uh, uh, islands. Um, I think uh, Prime Minister Abe, the former Prime Minister, had some hope, and we still maybe have a hope or wish, uh, but uh, it, it doesn't seem to be coming uh, to be realized. In other words, uh, it is very difficult to talk about the uh, uh, territorial issues with uh, Russia. Uh, we hope that uh, they were forthcoming in discussions if uh, we can cooperate in economic terms, but uh, it doesn't seem to be happening that way. So uh, territorial issues uh, is Russia uh, is not going anywhere. And uh, many people are not so hopeful. Although of course we, we like to see that happens, but uh, return of uh, islands uh, uh, up north may not be so uh, realistic. I, I, let me just say that I'm a 
<laughs> kind of excuse. I'm an economist, and I'm not really following <laughs> closely these Russian uh, affairs. But uh, having said this, of course, you know Russia uh, is a very important source of natural resources, just like maybe uh, Germany too. So uh, it is a very important relationship. I mean, our relationship with Russia is very important, but it's not an easy relationship. I have to say. Thank you. Um, I would like to discuss the uh, uh, role of Russia also with Mr. Um, Kroot and Mr. Ms. Bosse, but unfortunately time is running out, therefore we have to come to an end. And I would like to thank uh, the panelists, uh, Ms. Bosse, um, I'm sorry, Ms. Bosse, Mr. Kroot and Mr. Rata. Thanks for your inputs. Um, and of course, thanks to Ms. Kavahara and uh, to Mr. Plettenberg for preparing our discussion. And thanks for having me here. And thanks to the audience listening to us and dis even discussing with us. And um, all I have to say now is my name is Andreas Schwarzkopf. Ich, my, uh, I'm from Frankfurter Rundschau and I wish you a, a pleasant day. Goodbye.